Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, AstraZeneca in the spotlight again as Canada advises against getting the shot for those under 55. This vaccine has had all the ups and downs. It looks like a roller coaster. There have been no cases of rare blood clots in Canada, but health officials press pause. This vaccine that's had a lot of confusion uh, surrounding it. Tonight, we untangle the latest recommendations and address your concerns. Also tonight, the murder trial of a former police officer that stands for so much more. America, this is the moment the whole world is watching. The killing of George Floyd sparked a global reckoning on systemic racism and what the prosecution has to prove. BC's circuit breaker shutdown comes with a stern message from the Premier to young people. Do not blow this for the rest of us. And unstuck. Smooth sailing on the Suez. This is The National. Well, just as Canada's vaccine rollout is hitting its stride, safety concerns have health officials pivoting once again. Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization is pausing the use of AstraZeneca for those under the age of 55 after reports of rare blood clots in some patients outside of Canada. It is another big setback for a vaccine that cannot catch a break. And for some Canadians, including those who've already had the shot, there is now a deeply unsettling feeling. Tonight, we will tackle that uncertainty head on, breaking down the new guidelines, why they're changing again, and what that means for the rollout and you. David Cochran begins our coverage tonight, walking us through the latest guidance and why it's happening now. A pause button so they can stop and investigate means new guidance for people under 55. There is substantial uncertainty about the benefit of providing AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine to adults under 55 years of age, given the potential risks. Those potential risks, a rare type of blood clot. No known cases in Canada, but a few dozen reported in Europe, mostly among young women with some deaths. We want this vaccine program to be safe. Um, and while you know, we still believe that probably the benefits for all ages outweigh the risks, I'm not comfortable with probably. Initially pegged at one in a million, new data from Germany puts the risk at one in 100,000. So Canada is pressing pause until it gets even more data from Europe. This vaccine has had all the ups and downs. It looks like a roller coaster. Canada's AstraZeneca guidance has changed before. At first warning, nobody over 65 should use it. Later saying it was okay. Now saying it's only for 55 and up. This can be confusing, and especially with this vaccine that's had a lot of, um, you know, confusion uh, surrounding it. AstraZeneca says it will work with Health Canada but defends its vaccine. Regulatory authorities have concluded that the benefits significantly outweigh the risks across all adult age groups. Tens of millions of people have now received our vaccine across the globe. That includes about 300,000 Canadians. The recently vaccinated are being told to watch for symptoms. Such as shortness of breath, chest pain, leg swelling, persistent abdominal pain, sudden onset of severe or persistent worsening headaches or blurred vision, and skin bruising, other than at the site of vaccination. Some European countries stopped using AstraZeneca entirely when blood clots appeared. Most have resumed using it, several with age restrictions. But public confidence in the vaccine has dropped. A significant concern here in Canada, with one and a half million doses set to arrive on Tuesday. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And with those doses on the way, the concern now turns to Canadians' confidence in the shots. For those who have yet to roll up their sleeve and those who already have. Magda Gabrasalasa covers that angle on a day that saw much worry over the message. This morning, Ontario's health minister went sleeveless to get the AstraZeneca vaccine. I really encourage everyone to do that. But later, the premier said if problems pop up with the vaccine, he'd put a stop to it. I'd, I'd rather wait. Uh, it means a month or two months for Pfizer and Moderna and, and J&J &J, than uh, roll the dice on, on this uh, AstraZeneca. 
In between came breaking news about the new caution from doctors. It includes that warning to watch for symptoms. That has BC teacher Annie O'Hanna worried. Being a woman, 38, so I'm in that category of under 55. After the first set of NACI guidelines recommended against giving the shot to people over 65, provinces got creative. BC chose to hand it out to people in priority jobs like teachers. There are no reports of those rare blood clot issues in Canada, and that gives this teacher some relief, but she wonders... Well, what happens to those of us with our first vaccine, or first round? NACI will review evidence as it emerges to provide advice to public health programs on the potential for completing the vaccine series with other vaccine products. Now concern about the message. Even before today, Ohana says she already saw hints of vaccine preference. A lot of teachers even asked if it was possible to choose a vaccine or perhaps delay uh, if it was AstraZeneca. This doctor is cautioning people from making quick judgments about the vaccine. Once we get more and more data and get the overall safety of it, I think that we'll have a much better idea. But again, I think we really should look at UK and see 11 million doses and no major safety signal. Poor timing for uncertainty surrounding one of the vaccines that could put a stop to the rising tide of cases. Magda Gebrasalas, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, now I want to bring in Dr. Susie Hoda, infectious diseases specialist for more on this, because I, I, I really just want to know what your, your bottom line takeaway is. I've learned not to jump when I hear this kind of an update. And a part of it is we're just watching what's supposed to happen unfold. You know, bits and pieces of information might come forward at different times, and the experts have to weigh it all and try and figure out what to do with it. So, you know, I, I don't think this is uh, an automatic, oh my God, kind of situation, um, but we just need to see what comes out of the investigation. And, and what are you expecting to come out of this investigation, given uh, uh, kind of where the science is in the world? I mean, is there a chance that NACI decides to revise this recommendation, change course altogether? There always is that possibility, right? And uh, like I said, some of it emerges over time. So they're trying to weigh the risks of the benefits of pausing while um, investigating something or having to go ahead because the risk of waiting and not immunizing people is greater than that. So and we tend to lean more on the side of saying, we, let's hold when we're investigating a safety concern as opposed to what we saw mm. with the over 65 hold, where it was more on, we just don't have the information. Right. Yeah, that's an important difference there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hoda. And we are going to have you and Dr. Zane Chagla joining us a little bit later in the program to talk more. Thanks very much. Thanks. Now, amid all that new uncertainty over a crucial vaccine, COVID-19 is unfortunately mounting a comeback. The trend is clear in new daily cases. The seven-day average rising for more than a week now, reaching a level not seen since late January. There's a fresh warning tonight in Ontario. The number of COVID patients in intensive care is up 28% from late December, the start of the last province-wide lockdown. And in BC tonight, rising case numbers, a stern warning from the Premier, and some of the toughest restrictions in months. Greg Rasmussen on sweeping new changes and what a circuit breaker lockdown looks like. Already quiet, this Vancouver restaurant that relies mainly on indoor dining will be hit hard by new restrictions, the tightest in nearly a year. For us, it means we're going from about 90 seats to 19, um, and we'll be laying off about 90% of our staff. The reason? The seven-day average is now nearly 800 cases per day, and health officials say it's critical to reverse the trend. A circuit breaker is now required to break the chains of transmission in our province and allow us to safely move forward through this next phase. She says indoor activities are the biggest threat, so dining inside at restaurants, indoor adult group fitness classes and in-person religious gatherings will be suspended for at least three weeks. BC's Premier points his finger at 20 to 39 year olds, saying they're not taking the threat seriously enough. My appeal to you is do not blow this for the rest of us. Do not blow this for your parents and your neighbours and others who have been working really, really hard, making significant sacrifices. Another big impact, the immediate shutdown of the province's largest ski area, Whistler Blackcomb. 
The resort has seen a significant number of cases, and it's also being criticized as a magnet for non-essential travel. This is devastating, and it's not something that we can take on alone. We will need the continued support of the federal and provincial governments. For now, dining on patios will still be allowed, but for many businesses and workers, more financial pain. Officials say it's necessary, despite the hit. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Let's turn now to the big story developing in the U.S. today. Ten months after George Floyd's death sparked outrage and fueled mass protests against racism and police brutality, the former police officer charged with murdering him is now on trial. Opening arguments and first witnesses were heard today in a Minneapolis courtroom. Floyd died last May as Derek Chauvin pressed his knee into the black man's neck for about nine minutes. Floyd's repeated pleas of I can't breathe, recorded by a bystander, became a rallying cry of protests across the U.S. and Canada. Now that video showing George Floyd's death helped push his story into the national spotlight, and it has already become a key piece of evidence in this trial. But given how graphic and disturbing it is, CBC News is choosing not to rebroadcast it unless it is absolutely necessary for understanding. Susan Ormiston is in Minneapolis tonight. And Susan, can you walk us through this? Day? You know, an emotional first day here with the Floyd family outside the court, setting the tone for what will be a momentous trial. We still Floyd strong hmm. and we still here. That's so right. we gonna hold it down for him. George Floyd's brother you know Terrence and put it plainly. They say trust the system. They want us to trust the system. Well, this is your chance to show us. The Floyd family, their attorney, making it clear this trial is about equal justice. We know if George Floyd was a white American citizen and he suffered this painful, torturous death with a police officer knee on his neck, Nobody, nobody, nobody will be saying this is a hard case. In opening arguments, prosecutors laid out their case against Derek Chauvin. That Mr. Chauvin was anything other than innocent. That the former Minneapolis police officer did not and would not let up. That he put his knees upon his neck and his back, grinding and crushing him. But the exact cause of Floyd's death will be intensely argued. Defense signaling its strategy that other factors contributed to his death. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl. The trial lasting possibly a month is being broadcast live. The jurors who can't be identified, eight white men and women, four black and two multiracial, including alternates, more diverse than the population in the county. The defense warning the jurors. There is no political or social cause in this courtroom. But outside, George Floyd's killing has galvanized a movement demanding change and justice, including here at this courthouse, barricaded, protected by the state's National Guard. We'll send a message what happens in this trial. It will send a message as to what's acceptable police behavior um, and what's not. Tonight, another demonstration, peaceful, a consistent rumbling behind this trial. And Susan, what's your sense of, of the role that video of Floyd's death will play in this trial? Well, for so many, it's proof positive, and the prosecution really dug in, playing the entire painful nine minutes for the jurors today, many of whom had never seen it in its entirety, and now they have. And so how does the defense counter it? Well, to try to inject reasonable doubt that the knee hold was not the cause of death, knowing they only have to convince one juror to upset any unanimous verdict, Adrian. All right, Susan, thank you. Senior correspondent Susan Ormiston in Minneapolis tonight. 
Now, with that video etched in the minds of so many, it is tempting to think that the prosecution would have an easy job ahead. But, of course, they will need to convince the jury on those specific charges. Chauvin faces Ellen Morrow takes us through the burden of proof. Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge. Derek Chauvin faces three charges in the killing of George Floyd, second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. Multiple charges mean a greater chance of conviction. In a criminal case, of course, if you have one charge and you're not able to meet your burden, then that's it um, for you as the prosecutor. The burden is on the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt Chauvin caused Floyd's death. It's hard to remind jurors that reasonable doubt does not mean all doubt. It's not 100% certainty. It, it's within reason. Is it reasonable? None of the charges require the state to show Chauvin intended to kill Floyd. The second degree unintentional murder charge accuses Chauvin of causing the death of a human being without intent while committing or attempting to commit a felony, in this case assault. The third degree murder charge causing the death of another by perpetrating an act eminently dangerous without regard for human life. And second degree manslaughter causing death through culpable negligence. It's going to depend on the juror's tolerance for the idea that this particular law enforcement officer acted in a manner that was wholly inappropriate. Um, and this um, has to do with their ability to see George Floyd as a person who shouldn't have been treated um, in that manner. Black lives, they matter here. Floyd's killing ignited global protests against police brutality. The same anger erupting after past killings of other black men by police. There were videos before, All right. and you didn't give us justice. The country waits to see if this time will be different. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. In Ontario, the police watchdog has concluded no wrongdoing in the death of a black man at the hands of police. The province's police watchdog ruled that three officers involved in Clive Mensah's death did in fact use significant force when they tasered, pepper sprayed and restrained the 30-year-old, but that they acted reasonably. Mensah was suffering from a mental health condition, possibly schizophrenia, and he obeyed a police command to get on the ground. His family say they are devastated by today's decision. Well, more details tonight about the murder investigation at a hospital in Hawkesbury, Ontario, including the name of the victim. He's 89-year-old Albert Poitinger from the Montreal area. Very nice guy. Uh, him and his wife, Inge, uh, lived here. And, uh, yeah, no, he was just a super nice guy, always very pleasant. That's, uh, I'm pretty shocked to hear that. Today, Poitinger's family issued a statement asking for privacy as they grieve and understand what has happened to our loved husband, father, grandfather, father-in-law, and brother. A physician at the hospital, Dr. Brian Nadler, has been charged with first-degree murder. Police say there have been other suspicious deaths at the facility and are awaiting post-mortem results. We are also getting new details tonight about the mass stabbing in British Columbia over the weekend including more information about those injured and killed in the attack. Briar Stewart takes us through what we know about the victims and the attacker. Among the many who come to this growing memorial, some of the victims from Saturday's rampage. A mask conceals some of Emma Henderson's wounds. The 22-year-old university student was one of those attacked near the library. She's now recovering, and so are five others, including a high school teacher and a single mother. A young woman in her 20s was killed in the attack. And the more that time has passed since, you realize the magnitude of it. And, you know, there's not a member in this community within, you know, 20 blocks that hasn't come to this square in, you know, in recent days. Steve Mossup was here Saturday and tried to help the victims. He also saw the accused, 28-year-old Yannick Bandaogu, on the ground. Come your head! Come your head! After his arrest, he was taken to hospital where he was treated for self-inflicted injuries. We continue to investigate the potential motive behind the incident, as well as the suspect's background and history in British Columbia. Bandaogu was of no fixed address and previously lived in Quebec. His criminal record includes convictions for assault with a weapon and assaulting a peace officer in that province. 
At the time of the attack, he was wanted on warrants there and also in Manitoba. Police are still trying to piece together the attack and what led up to it. None of the victims were connected to the accused. For me, it's just physically being here and seeing the memorial grow um, and just taking a moment to think about the victims. The community has set up a place where residents can speak to grief counselors as many struggle with the trauma that unfolded here. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, blizzard-like conditions are being blamed for traffic chaos in southern Alberta. Oh my God! Yeah, some terrifying moments captured on tape, driving in pretty treacherous conditions. Luckily, no one was hurt in this collision. Nearby, though, RCMP say at least five people were hurt after whiteout conditions led to a pileup involving as many as 70 vehicles. Now, something to cheer about, meanwhile, today, halfway around the world, that colossal cargo ship stuck in the Suez Canal, blocking it for nearly a week, is finally unstuck. But as Sasha Petrosik explains, the backlog it's created will take a little longer to work through. <laughs> The cheers of tugboat crews echoed along the Suez Canal as the colossal cargo ship finally came loose, ending a crisis that blocked much of the world's shipping for almost a week. In the end, it took lunar tides and ocean currents, tugs and earth diggers to nudge free the enormous Ever Given, a ship longer than any Canadian skyscraper is tall. We used the water power that was in the canal with the returning tides to push the vessel where we were pulling it. And the combination of the two, as we hoped, at the end of the day did the trick. The backlog of some 400 ships carrying $10 billion worth of goods has now started to move. Oh, let's go. The big boat's predicament sparked joy online, but now in Europe, shipping capitals, serious questions are being asked. You know, what, what do we do going forward to ensure it doesn't happen again? Perhaps better infrastructure to handle today's bigger boats and contingency plans so not everything is imported from one place. You need your supply chain to be flexible. You need your supply chain to be robust. You need to plan for this event ahead of time. You don't want to find yourself suddenly surprised by something like this with no ability to react. It will take days for the Suez backlog to clear, months for ports to handle all the ships now heading their way. And for Canadian consumers, likely some higher prices. All those goods awaiting missing parts. But on this sandy stretch of Egypt, the big thing now is to celebrate. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Eastern Europe is struggling to contain a new wave of COVID-19 infections. Tracing was poor, the testing was poor, the information was not good. Up next, how the situation in the Czech Republic got so bad so fast. Plus, a pandemic lifeline for young adults. You do a lot of listening. Yeah. What do people tell you? Young Canadians open up about the struggles they faced and the unique places they're finding support. And later, a recipe for instant gardening success. Sometimes I have to take out my seeds, cook, and then put them back in. We're back in two. I'm asking you to just hold on a little longer, to get vaccinated when you can, so that all of those people that we all love will still be here when this pandemic ends. In the United States, an emotional plea from the head of the CDC, sharing a feeling of impending doom, as she called it. COVID cases have spiked there after spring break travel. And the president pledged today that in three weeks, 90% of all Americans will be eligible for a shot and within five miles of a vaccination site. Across Eastern Europe, though, infection is now outpacing vaccination in several countries, including Hungary, Poland and Slovakia. As Rene Filipponi tells us, in recent weeks, the Czech Republic has had some of the highest rates in the world for infection and death. Crosses painted on Prague's Old Town Square represent the more than 25,000 people who have died from COVID-19 here. Their loved ones come to grieve. 
My brother was supposed to be vaccinated and did not live to see it, says Anna Vodachova. COVID chewed him up. The Czech Republic, like many countries in Eastern Europe, has been hit hard by this latest variant-ridden wave of COVID. Infection rates and hospitalizations have soared. Patients have been sent to neighboring countries for treatments. And the number of deaths in the country have more than doubled since January. The problem is that we are doing things many countries started to do months ago. This epidemiologist says there are signs things are getting better, but he blames the government for not acting fast enough. Tracing was poor, the testing was poor, the information was not good, <laughs> and the variants came. And those variants spread quickly in a country where many work in factories, so physical distancing is difficult. Companies have now been ordered to do mass testing. This Czech sociologist says a long-standing lack of trust in the government has made things worse. It leads people have a lower compliance with the rules after these, you know, one year of restrictions. And like other EU countries, the Czech vaccine rollout is delayed with the supply shortage. Inspired by nearby Hungary, the Czech government has expressed an interest in using the Russian Sputnik vaccine, despite it not being approved by the EU. Another challenge here is vaccine hesitancy. I don't take the flu shot, then I don't need to take like the shot for the coronavirus. But for others, another wave and another lockdown highlights the only way out. I think vaccine is only future for everybody. A post-pandemic future that can't come soon enough. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. When we come back, what you need to know if you've just received or are about to get the AstraZeneca vaccine. Our panel of doctors will help us through what it all means for your next shot. There has been no accidents. It's all meant to be. And later, how a Nova Scotia couple brought the Mi'kmaq language to a popular TV show. Welcome back. How to process the news on the AstraZeneca vaccine, that it's being put on pause for people under 55. Not to mention, what if you've already gotten the shot? Or maybe you're over 55 and you're about to get it. We're going to get some answers from infectious diseases specialist Dr. Susie Hoda and Dr. Zane Chagla. Dr. Hoda, I'd like if I could just to start with a really blunt question to you. Is there any reason someone who's already gotten the shot should worry that they've gotten an unsafe vaccine? I think, you know, to put it all in perspective, first of all, this is a very rare event to our understanding at the moment. So, you know, I would hate for people to panic on that. It's certainly important to explore what the possibility is and what's behind this, um, but it's being investigated. So it's it's not a matter of panic. It's, it's a matter of being vigilant and monitoring and making sure that you don't develop the symptoms that are of concern. There have been millions of doses of this vaccine that have already been distributed, of course, internationally. Uh, Dr. Chagla, here's a question from John McCann. He says, I'm 50 and took the AstraZeneca Oxford COVID-19 shot. What happens next? And, and of course, it's a good question because this is a two-dose regime, right? So might John not get the second dose? Might there be mixing of vaccines? How would this play out? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, you know, the first... 20 days or so, and most of the people have been noticed in the first four to 20 days to develop symptoms, abdominal pain, severe headache, bleeding, bruising, chest pain, or leg swelling, that they seek medical help. But people after day 20 seem not to have developed this. The question is, is what to do with that second dose? Now, the nice thing is AstraZeneca, the data suggests 12 weeks is when the second dose should be given, or even later than that. So there is time the dust is going to settle and really we're going to find out what this vaccine actually means, what the risks are in particular groups uh, and what the risks are with revaccination. I think once that settles, if people shouldn't receive the AstraZeneca vaccine, yes, they may be switched over to another. And we're actually having clinical trials that are completing for mixing vaccines that might actually support that use. Or if the dust settles and it's a very minor issue, the risks are exceptionally low, then potentially people circle back and get their second AstraZeneca dose. Right. But, but of course, I mean, Dr. Hoda, we're having this conversation right now, right? And I can't help but think, what would you say to those folks who have watched the AstraZeneca roller coaster up and down, up and down, and now think, hey, maybe the safest play is just not to get on that roller coaster, just to wait for a vaccine that has fewer question marks. 
All of this is about weighing the risks and the benefits. And right now, in many parts of our country, we're heading into pretty dramatic third waves of COVID-19. And so having the option of multiple vi uh, vaccines out there is really helpful, and we need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So, you know, recognizing that right now there's a pause on the under 55 age group for AstraZeneca, I, I don't think this means that as a black blanket statement, we need to abandon this vaccine and that we should just be looking at all the other options uh, outside of AstraZeneca. It's still a, a useful vaccine for, for people who are over that age group. But Dr. Chagla, just one last question. Why, why haven't we seen this sort of talk about the Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson vaccines? I mean, it would lead someone to wonder, is there something fundamentally wrong with the AstraZeneca vaccine? You know, when these types of things happen, again, we're talking, you know, the first signal in the first million, two million people. And often, if there is a rare reaction, people may say it's an anomaly, may not recognize it. Once you start recognizing the first one, then you go back and you start recognizing a pattern and it goes from there. This is what post-marketing surveillance looks like. Mm. You know, right now, there isn't anything that has been seen in the Pfizer and Moderna rollout but it doesn't necessarily say in the future that there won't be one of these post-marketing claims for those vaccines too. Right. And so, you know, again, I don't want to necessarily say AstraZeneca is the only one singled out here. This is how post-marketing surveillance works. And, and again, this is how we adjust to it. Okay, doctors, we are going to have to leave it there. Dr. Hoda, Dr. Chagla, thank you very much for your time. Thank no you. problem. And up next, supporting young Canadians during the pandemic. I just felt like nothing was really going my way and everything was just going down. We're going to take you inside youth wellness hubs, home to all kinds of solutions to a pretty glaring pandemic problem. We'll be right back. Well, even before the pandemic, research showed mental health services weren't always meeting the needs of young people. In 2017, Ontario's answer was the wellness hub. 10 one-stop shops to serve ages 12 to 25 with a full menu of services, everything from counseling to help finding a job. But then COVID arrived and those hubs became more needed than ever. So we decided to check in with three people who found three very different ways forward. Welcome back to another Budget Bites. Budget Bites, Budget Bites, where we bite the budget. It is entertaining, yes. <laughs> Breaks are open. I'm gonna rip them apart and hope for the best. Give this a try. But there is more to what you see here than simply how to make a good breakfast sandwich. But we try to just show you kind of how to adult. Because adulting's hard and not all of us were taught these skills. Amber Scott is a peer support worker. She knows how hard it is to grow up in a lockdown. She hears it every day. You do a lot of listening. Yeah. What do people tell you? It really varies. Some people get really deep into their stories, their mental health struggles, um, things that are going on in their life. Some of it is really, really heavy stuff. In Midland, Ontario, at this youth hub, teens and young adults, 12 to 25, can ask for help with almost anything, virtually or in person. Hello. Can you tell me about what you see? A lot of people lost their job due to COVID um, and losing your job, that's a financial strain, which makes it hard to pay rent and it makes it hard to pay groceries and any bills that you have. So, so these are the bags over here? Yeah, these are the That's bags. where these come in. Um, 20 bucks worth of groceries in each bag, often including things Amber teaches how to cook. What kind of a difference does it make? for a family to have one of these bags? It makes a huge difference. It could keep them from starving for the week. How's school going? Doing fine. Part of COVID's cruelty is how when one problem hits, another okay. usually and isn't far behind. Food, employment, housing, they're all linked. And they're all hard to talk about. I struggled with my mental health, depression, anxiety. I hit it for a long time, a long, long time. And um, I wasn't comfortable talking to anyone about it. It was kind of a taboo subject, in my opinion. 40% of youth in Ontario say their mental health has taken a hit in the last year. Kids Help Phone took 4 million calls last year, and each experience is different. <laughs> Before COVID, Keenan thought he had it mostly together for a 22-year-old. 
He'd come out as transgender years earlier as a teen, felt comfortable, accepted. But when COVID hit, it started to fall apart. I used to get up and go to work the same time every day, come home, do the same things, you know. And now that I just have no routine, it's very difficult for me to keep on track with everything. With his hours cut at a local Dairy Queen and no structure, Keenan started drinking more. He was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, was even homeless for a short time. I got into some bad things that I should not have been into in the first place, um, and it really took a toll on me, and it was really difficult to get out of those things. Then, five months ago, he tried to take his own life. I, I just felt like nothing was really going my way, and everything was just going down. Like, one bad thing after another was just, it was reoccurring, and I couldn't really take it anymore is how I felt. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a very difficult time for me. I heard a lot of the people closest to me. Hey, uh, Keenan. Contact with people in crisis like Keenan have increased by 17% at this youth hub in Chatham. Similar services elsewhere, cancel or online only during the lockdown. But here, Keenan was still able to get in-person counseling. How are you doing with the drinking? I really have slowed down a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like you have, for sure. It's exactly. to the point where I'd like wake up the next day and like it was still a blur from like... The night before. Yeah. And, and it was more than just talk. Yeah. Okay. They helped him find an apartment, get his medications, and most importantly, they listen. You know, things still are rough. You know, everyone has their days, um, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm slowly getting there. <laughs> Then there's Halliburton, a pretty idyllic place to grow up, but it is remote, and 18-year-old Finn Tentry says he started to feel trapped. At this point, I, I'm probably a different person than I was last year. Um, my stutter came back a fair bit. Finn was used to being active, social. Now, he hasn't seen some friends in over a year. If I was in a group of people again, could I socialize without just feeling awkward and out of place? The motion feels alien at this point. <laughs> And that disconnect is real on a few levels. Out here, the internet, so important for staying in touch, is not only expensive, it is unreliable. Live streaming classes for high school was next to impossible. I couldn't really get into live streams for the most part. So a lot of it was just reading documents and skimming my textbook, trying to just teach myself chemistry. <laughs> it didn't, didn't work. <laughs> Finn had even been accepted to Carleton University in Ottawa, but turned it down, sure that online classes just wouldn't work. And there was no guarantee he'd ever get back in. I know it's silly to say it, but it doesn't seem fair. It's just an easy word to throw around, but that being said, a lot of us do want to get out of here. <laughs> okay, we're gonna put stuff in the trunk. But needing help and offering it can sometimes be one and the same. Finn. Yep. Okay on Finn the started okay. getting involved with Marg, Cox, and others at this local youth hub, giving out tablets and phones with 50 gigs of data so they can stream their classes, but also stay connected. The county even pitched in $25,000 to the project. Is that lots of people that never experienced mental health issues are now experiencing during COVID. Youth more than ever need to be around other youth. They need to be starting to get ready to be more independent. It's one of those developmental stages that's normal. Today, Finn considers himself lucky. He's been accepted into Carleton University for next year. Question is, how much of COVID's legacy will linger even then? Or do you have any doubts that life will get back to normal as we knew it? I think so. I think humans are really resilient. As Amber makes her final delivery for the day, a food bag so, for Hunter, yeah, who has been fine. living in this hotel for six months. Thank you. You're welcome. She knows there's no escaping from hardship, but there are plenty of ways to work through it. It might take a long time, and it might take a lot of work and a lot of healing, but I do believe that we will get back to a place of normalcy. Still ahead, how one Nova Scotia couple's mission to preserve their Mi'kmaq language 
led them to work on a popular TV show. We will take you behind the scenes. But first, we want to give you a preview of a story you'll see tomorrow night here on The National, a conversation with Canadian Olympian Perdita Felicien. We're here not just because, you know, you need to get your steps in. <laughs> <laughs> Perdita Felicien is Canada's most decorated female track athlete and has been hanging on to, until now, a story that makes her both furious and fiercely proud. She is her mother's daughter and they both had a rough go. Catherine, coming to this country as a teenage nanny, only to be abused, berated and belittled by host families. You know, she goes into labor with me uh, in the basement where she's living. She's a domestic worker and um, no one wants to take her to the hospital. I mean, well, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. How the power of a good mom made a champion. Welcome back. From a makeshift studio in a Nova Scotia garage to the filming of the popular TV show Vikings, a Canadian couple is sharing how opportunity just came knocking. As Kayla Hounsell tells us, it was all for their love of the Mi'kmaq language. The Emmy Award-winning Vikings chronicles the saga of the Norse warriors. But listen. These characters are speaking Mi'kmaq, something they learned with the help of this Nova Scotia couple. First, from afar. Uh, they wanted us to translate some lines into Mi'kmaq. In the show's finale, the Vikings discover the new land, now known as Newfoundland, and the Beothic people, now extinct, Mi'kmaq is considered the closest indigenous language. I became worried that we weren't diving deeply enough in, into this culture. So in 2018, the show's creator flew the Johnsons to Ireland to help the actors on set. It was very reassuring. I felt we had the real, we had the real people running the show at that point. The incredible journey all started here in Eskasoni on Cape Breton Island. Actually, it started in the Johnson's garage. For years, they've used this makeshift studio to record music and the stories of their elders. And this. They overdubbed the DreamWorks movie Chicken Run, trying to make Mi'kmaq fun. We watched it every time we would go on a road trip, and like that's what made us like, speak a lot of um, Mi'kmaq. Wow, it just... Uh... It makes, it inspires me to want to create something more for these children. Because if we don't do anything, it's, it's so sad. Uh, we'll lose our language. So when Vikings called Cape Breton University looking for Mi'kmaq speakers, the Johnsons were a natural fit. And once they got to Ireland, they were told to interject. We appreciated that very much because... Uh, both of us wanted us to make sure that it was as authentic uh, as possible. It's not lost on them that they were brought into this experience because of an extinct indigenous language at a time when they spend so much energy fighting to save their own. There has been no accidents. It's all meant to be. They hope hearing Mi'kmaq in mainstream productions will reignite a passion in others to preserve all Indigenous languages. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Eskasoni First Nation. Okay, next on The National, a new recipe for your Instant Pot. More than just cooking food, how about growing it? Well, the famous Canadian kitchen appliance, the Instant Pot, boasts it can do a lot. And according to one Ottawa woman, it can do more than just cook food. Leanne Bitsy wanted to figure out a way to germinate her seeds so that they could grow faster. And it looks like she found it. Her at-home hack is our moment. I failed so often at pepper seeds before. <laughs> I had to find a different way without wasting my seeds that I bought. I've had my Instant Pot for a long time. I love cooking in it. So I just decided to try it and it worked really well. It's the same thing as in a lab where you have an incubator for your, your, your bacteria. Experimenting is like in my blood. I like my past was in the labs. What's very important here is that it's not under pressure. It's really just using the yogurt setting. The heat is the perfect heat. It's the same heat as you would have in a hot country. So for hot pepper seeds, it's perfect. 
COVID gardening is therapeutic. You lose that social uh, part of your life and you need something to fill that part. Sometimes I have to take out my seeds, cook, make sure it goes down in temperature and then put them back in. Might as well get an inspo and do many things with it. <laughs> okay, so she insists she's not the first person to try this, but I'm willing to bet she's the first person to take it as far as she wants to, which is that, you know, skip the whole like tweezers and little seeds. Just put the whole pot with the soil in the other pot. Really? And just get it done. Now I'm imagining a whole field just yeah, full exactly. of yeah, full of instant pot. Yeah, exactly. And so she's done uh, peppers, right? And and she's done eggplants apparently. Check check. Next one, watermelons. I don't. Huh. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But I can't wait to see it. That's the national for this March 29th. Have a great night. Good night.